Hello everyone, welcome to Cash Crop TV. My name is Kalen Ashcroft. Thank you very much for watching this episode of Ages of Empires, where we will be covering Pashupati of the Indus Valley Civilization Empire and Rim Sin I of the Larsa Empire. So, as mentioned previously, these are based on, or rather, inspired by the decline and fall of the of the Roman Empire by Gibbon, as noted. Uh, it's only the decline that's really covered in uh, Gibbon's work. However, that is the sort of the foundation text that I'm reading as I'm studying these empires too. So it's kind of the inspiration. And I guess the main takeaway here is why do empires fall? And I think that has a real world implication today. I often sometimes or sometimes have book suggestions. So I also add um, kind of very different from previous book suggestions, but uh, security analysis by Benjamin Graham and David L. Dodd. Uh, this is the sixth edition here. Um, yeah, I'm also, I guess, one of my other passions besides history and philosophy and such is finance. And this is one of the, it's one of the older textbooks and I do have an affinity towards classics and older books. So this is the one, I guess, for one interested in getting invest, interested in investing now, probably start with The Intelligent Investor by the same authors. That's Benjamin Graham and David L. Dodd. However, there's also like, Beating the Street and those other such books, but even those are even a little bit dated too. But nonetheless, I think um, these, it's a foundational textbook that I think one who really wants to advance their understanding of finance is a good book to, or a phenomenal book to look into. And I think Benjamin, um, no, pardon me, Warren Buffett really um, bases much of his investment philosophy off this and. I think many of the principles still apply today, but nonetheless, that's sort of not necessarily the interest of those watching this, but something that I'm interested in, so I thought I'd share that as well. And uh, also, I note, not all of these are necessarily empires. I think it's debated whether the Indus Valley civilization was an empire. I think one of the qualifications is that there have to be m multiple groups of people consolidated under one empire, but, or under one leader. However, I think it's p possible that the Indus Valley civilization was an empire, and as for the Larsa, they did encompass other city-states at some point, but nonetheless, in the original list that I found for all the empires of the world, these two were included, and I think it would not give us a full picture of world history if we did not cover these. And also, I noticed that these we kind of go into the same depth as Gibbon did with um, with the with Rome or as Shearer did with the rise and fall of the Third Reich. However, we will probably well we will certainly get much more breadth, so we will be covering many empires. And lastly, if this is the first episode you've been seeing, it will, we will cover both a leader and a and an empire, and a leader, and an empire, and then we'll have a comparison between the two leaders in the style of Plutarch's parallel lives to hopefully learn a little bit about leadership as well. So without further ado, we will begin with the Indus Valley Civilization and Pushupati. And perhaps this will be maybe, unfortunately, there, were, there are no known specific leaders of the Indus Valley Civilization. So for, the, for this episode, we have had to use a god. So Pushupati is in fact a god. So it's obviously not a fair comparison to compare him with Rimsin I, the first part of me, with Pashupati, a god and a mortal. But nonetheless, we might still be able to learn something about leadership or perhaps more likely their two respective civilizations or empires. So starting with the rise and the fall of the Indus Valley Civilization. So the Indus Valley Civilization, also known as the Harappan Civilization, emerged around 3300 BCE in what is now modern day Pakistan and Northwest India. It spanned over, two, over a millennium if, and it flourished as one of the world's earliest urban civilizations. The civilization's rise and eventual decline is a testament to its remarkable achievements as well as the challenge it challenges it faced. So starting with its early foundations from 3300 BCE to 2000 pardon me about to sneeze <coughs> uh, pardon me and to 2600 BCE that's 3300 BCE to 2600 BCE that's the early foundations. So the roots of the Indus Valley civilization can be traced back to the fertile plains of the Indus River, where agricultural com communities thrived. Over time, these communities developed advanced techniques in farming, irrigation, and animal husbandry. 
Around 3,300 BCE, these scattered settlements coalesced into organized urban centers, the largest of which were Mo Mohenjo Daro and Harapa. Harapa. That's Mohenjo Daro and Harapa. Pardon me for my pronunciation. These cities were characterized by meticulously planned layouts, advanced drainage systems, and impressive structures made of stru standardized bricks. These early urban centers displayed signs of sophisticated social structure with evidence of central authority, trade networks, and a system of weights and measures. So there's this one investigative journalist I admire, Graham Hancock, he advocates that there were many, even perhaps larger civilizations far before these ancient civilizations that we cover here. And I think that's at least looking at some of these ruins. If this is perhaps the, the oldest civilization that we can we can track on record, how, look at how advanced they were in terms of street design, in terms of weights and such, it's like no human could lift those blocks to those size. And same thing applies to Egypt as well in Mesopotamia, if we, or particularly summer or Larsa, as we will cover soon. So nonetheless, I think there is, as far as I can see, perhaps maybe there were some civilizations even before this, but this is one of the earliest that we know. And it's considered one of the three um, uh, earliest civilizations in this area, including Mesopotamia and Egypt. However, Mesopotamia, we've kind of broken up into summer more generally, and Larsa, as we'll cover later, and also previously we covered Lagash. And the Egypt, we've covered in the Old Kingdom of Egypt, we also covered the Middle Kingdom of Egypt, and we'll later cover the Old Kingdom of Egypt. But this is sort of the other third element. This is the Indus Valley Civilization. So moving towards urban zenith, from 2600 BCE to 1900 BCE, this period between 2600 BCE and 1900 BCE marked the zenith for the Indus Valley Civilization. During this time, the urban centers expanded, reaching a population estimated at around 5 million people. So this is perhaps one of the largest ancient civilizations we have too. Trade networks extended from the Arabian Sea to Central Asia, connecting the Harappan cities with distant regions. So they could even uh, have trade networks and they were even communicating with other regions too. And perhaps um, they even maybe were able to cross the boat in the water and as we see there's this uh, as we'll cover the images later they they have at least a, 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 a statue of a terracotta boat so it's likely they had boats i think it would be not make sense to have a boat on land and not ha know how to use a boat on the water so it's interesting that they even one of the earliest civilizations had control over the seas to some extent moving to the challenges and decline from 1900 bce to 1700 bce so around 1900, the Indus Valley Civilization faced a series of challenges. Climatic shifts and natural disasters, possibly including a major earthquake, disrupted the delicate balance that sustained their agricultural systems. These events led to food shortages, po population pressures, and the potential spread of diseases. And per perhaps they're even finding evidence of tuberculosis in some, um, for example. Furthermore, evidence suggests the emergence of a new cultural groups and the migration from the possibly north, uh, possibly northwest, possibly the Indo-Aryan tribes, the, as some hypothesize, including Houston Chamberlain, the Aryans, and Houston Chamberlain is obviously very um, controversial, but nonetheless he does mention the Aryans who supposedly came from this region and then moved northwest, bringing linguistic and cultural changes. This period saw a decline in the urban centers, with some abandoned and some abandoned entirely. The previously unified culture fragmented into smaller regional cultures. So there's even, as we'll cover the images later, the the swastika was um, existed in some of these relics here, and that's where the Nazis ultimately took the swastika from. Moving to late period and abandonment from 1700 BCE to 1300 BCE. During the late period of the civilization from 1700 BCE to 1300 BCE, the remaining urban centers continued to exist, but on a smaller scale. Evidence suggests a more decentralized political structure with smaller towns and fortified settlements emerging in response to changing circumstances. So if they're needing to build fortified, fortified settlements, it's likely there were perhaps invasions as well, or perhaps unrest. 
Around 1300 BCE, the last phase of the Indus Valley civilization witnessed the eventual abandonment of the major urban centers. The reasons for this final collapse remain, uh, remain the subject of scholarly debate. Factors such as continued environmental challenges, shifts in trade routes, and possibly invasions or internal conflicts have been proposed. So a lot of this is speculative, but perhaps and I believe it was likely, I think it's, at least for me, it's, I'd like to believe things are more likely true than false, so I, maybe it's a combination of many of these factors. In terms of legacy and rediscovery, despite its decline and eventual disappearance, the Indus Valley civilization left a lasting legacy. Its achievements in urban planning, metallurgy, and trade influenced subsequent cultures in the Indian subcontinent, and I might also add probably the rest of the world. It just be a nature of being so early in time, its influence has a butterfly effect or sort of like an expanding effect throughout time, so I think it has it's even probably affects us today in ways we might not even know. The, uh, the, uh, the script, though undeciphered, the Indus Valley script continues to be a subject of scholarly interest. So anyone interested in languages, which I am myself, I, um, I study languages, a little bit of languages every day. And maybe I'll, I'll go on too much of a tangent, but I do. I write uh, it's, uh, sort of just lines and just 33 lines every day, just of a uh, one sentence translated. And yeah, it's just a little thing to do every day, and I think after 50 years I might amalgamate in some sort of memorization. But nonetheless, I am fascinated in ancient languages, but this is a challenge that perhaps I propose to someone who might be watching or, and or listening to this, that it's the, the script, the Indus Valley script, has still yet to be deciphered. So unlike the, the Egyptian um, hieroglyphs were uh, cracked the code through what's called the Rosetta Stone, which is in the British Museum. This code, we, there's um, this our script. There's still no code, and we still don't know what the symbols and script mean. So it's a great challenge. So and kind of I think it's it's not something to be lamented about. But I think it's something exciting, an opportunity for discovery. Who knows what could be in this writing, and maybe it might even detail what the what the swastika fundamentally means, which would be, have a huge significance. But uh, some people hypothesize there are um, certain um, definitions of the swastika, which I will not um, uh, elaborate on here. The rediscovery of the Indus Valley civilization in the 20th century through archaeological excavation has shed new light on this ancient culture. The artifacts, architectural remains, and urban planning of Mohenjo-Daro, Harappa, and other sites provide valuable insights into human civilization. Thus, the rise and fall of the Indus Valley civilization is a testament to the complexities of ancient societies. Its achievements, challenges, and ultimate decline offer valuable lessons about the delicate balance between human ingenuity and the natural environment. The legacy of this ancient civilization continues to shape our understanding of the origins of human civilization and the Indian subcontinent. So that is the history of the rise and fall of the Indus Valley Civilization Empire. Now we'll go into a biography as best we can of Pashupati, the Lord of Beasts, because no, no leaders um, have we identified yet today. So I've had to resort to a, a god, which um, I think will be fascinating, and at least it was fascinating to me. And I, I actually endeavored to find a link between ancient India and the Indus Valley Civilization, so sort of kind of creating continuity between the Indus Valley Civilization and later ancient India. So starting with a brief introduction, the annals of ancient, civil of ancient Indian spirituality, Pashupati stands as a revered deity whose origins trace back to the Indus Valley Civilization, a civilization that flourished along the banks of the Indus River over four millennia ago. Pashupati, the Lord of Beasts, embodies the convergence of natural forces, spirituality, and the reverence for the animal kingdom. This, uh, this, uh, here we will seek to illuminate the ancient roots of Pashupati, who serves as a bridge between the sacred traditions of the Indus Valley and the enduring spirituality of India. And I've actually covered uh, later some uh, ancient Egypt, uh, Indian philosophy, which I hope you uh, I would be interested in following in the uh, in one of my previous series. 
emergence from the Indus Valley. The origins of Pashupati are deeply intertwined with the sacred landscapes of the Indus Valley civilization, an ancient urban culture that thrived between approximately 3,300 BCE and 1,300 BCE, as previously mentioned. The city of Mohenjo-Daro, a crown jewel of this civilization, played a pivotal role in the emergence of Pashupati as a revered deity. In the archaeological excavations of Mohenjo-Daro, a significant artifact was unearthed, a seal depicting a central figure surrounded by animals. This enigmatic figure, seated on a, in a yogic posture with a headdress reminiscent of horns, came to be identified as Pashupati, the Lord of Beasts. This iconic seal, dating back to around 2500 BCE, offers a glimpse into the ancient roots of Pashupati's spiritual significance. So I wonder if even these horns have some connection with the later um, Indian reverence for bulls or cows. Moving to some more description of Pashupati, the Lord of Beasts. So Pashupati's identity is deeply intertwined with the natural world and the reverence for animals. As the Lord of Beasts, he embodies the primal energies that animate, animate the animal kingdom. He is both a guardian and a guide a divine force that transcends the boundaries between humans and creatures with whom they share the earth. This, in this ancient representation, Pashupati's headdress, adorned with bull's horns, signifies his dominion over the animal realm. His yogurt posture conveys a sense of serenity and introspection, underscoring his role as a spiritual guide who leads devotees on a transformative inner journey. So maybe that's even sort of foreshadowing the later um, yogic culture in Indian philosophy and religion or even the concept of nirvana which is uh, sort of a, a break from the perpetuity of, of reincarnation. Moving to spiritual significance, so Pashupati's association with yoga and meditation aligns him with the pursuit of spiritual enlightenment. He serves as a conduit for seekers guiding them on a path on the path of self-realization and inner harmony. In this capacity, Pashupati trans transcends the confines of the material world, inviting devotees to explore the depths of their own consciousness. As the Lord of Beasts, Pashupati also embodies the interconnectedness of all forms of life, and perhaps even to some extent equality or even maybe superiority, superiority of perhaps animals over humans, I wouldn't speculate on that, but nonetheless, at least perhaps equal. He reminds humanity of the sacred bond that unites humans with the animal kingdom, emphasizing the need for reverence, compassion, and stewardship towards all living beings. Moving to legacy and continuity, while the Indus Valley civilization eventually waned, Pashupati's legacy endured, transcending the confines of time and place. His symbolism and spiritual significance found a resonance in the evolving religious traditions of ancient India, eventually becoming a foundational aspect of Hinduism. The sacred site of Pashu, Pashupatinath temple in present-day Nepal stands as a testament to the enduring reverence for this ancient deity. Pilgrims from across the Indian subcontinent and beyond continue to pay homage to Pashupati, recognizing him as a source of spiritual guidance and a guardian to the natural world. So there is still a temple for Pashupati in Nepal, so he's still even revered. So this has gone back from 2500 BCE to 2023 as it is today. Thus, Pashupati, the Lord of Beasts, serves as a vital link between the ancient Indus Valley civilization and the enduring spiritual traditions of India, and Nepal as well, by effect. His image, etched into the annals of ancient seals, continues to inspire seekers and devotees, inviting them to explore the profound mysteries of existence. Pashupati's legacy endures as a testament to the timeless wisdom that transcends the boundaries of time and place, reminding us of the sacred interconnectedness that unites all living beings. So a little bit different from our previous biographies of leaders, but I think what I endeavor to do here is sort of connect the Indus Valley to ancient India, and by effect even to modern day um, pilgrimages to such as Nepal, which is a country I'd very much like to visit. I have been fortunate to visit India, I've only been to Rajasthan and uh, province and uh, and Udaipur, for example. But I'd also like to go to Nepal. I have some good friends there. But if someone can 
maybe one of you might be able to help sponsor me a plane ticket. I'd really like to go visit these places too, and I'd like, also like to explore Mohenjo-Daro and also the Indus Valley Civilization too. So I'm um, fascinated with these. That's why I also admire um, Graham Hancock, because he actually gets to go to these places. So one day, hopefully, I endeavor to do that. But I have been, I sort of surface level been to some of these places like India and such, but that's a little bit a different region, but nonetheless, uh, still much to do. So that is Pashupati and the Indus Valley Civilization. We'll talk a bit more about Pashupati in comparison with Rim Sin the first, or Rim Sin, I think it's pronounced. And But first, we'll go through the content of the slide here. So in the top left, we have an image of Pashupati. It's hard to depict where exactly his horns are, but supposedly this is him. There are other images where his horns are maybe more clear, but this is supposedly him, Pashupati, the Lord of Beasts. We have here that... Um, the Indus Valley civilization was the most widespread and populous ancient civilization. So if it did get up to five million, it was even larger than the largest, the peak, likely the peak of ancient Egypt. So the largest, but I maybe argued that maybe at no time were they completely amalgamated under the rule of one city or one leader. So maybe it wasn't necessarily an empire, but they were sufficiently connected to um, to call it one unit for. for um, for our purposes. Uh, in terms of in, um, information, we have significant god, Pashupati, empire, Indus Valley civilization, period circa 3300 to circa 1300 BCE, million square kilometers, 0 0.3, million square miles, 0 0.12, therefore percent of the world, excluding Antarctica, 0.22%, which doesn't sound like a lot, but it's really quite significant. Considering, considering a lot of the world was um, either uninhabited or uninhabitable at that time, or largest and most prominent cities, Harappa and Mohenjo-Daro, which perhaps one of them was a capital city, I want to determine. I'd like to think that maybe it was an empire at some point, or at least had some sort of centralized authority. Um, not actually uh, hard to say if, I, if that is what I would like to see, but I think it would be fascinating. I think to have such big structures, there had to be some sort of central planning. In terms of government, it was either perhaps a centralized authority or perhaps some governing body, so, and it's uncertain whether there was a monarch. Yeah. Common language was the Indus script, which is still yet undeciphered, so if someone might be able to decipher that, that would be a great achievement and would put someone in the history books for probably eternity, hopefully. So that's a challenge that I pose to you. Religion, ancient, uh, pardon me, it should not be ancient Egyptian, it should be part ancient, um, Indus Valley Civilization. So that's, pardon me, I forgot to delete that from the previous one, but that is, and perhaps, in, probably animate, or the, perhaps even worshipping animals as well. Population, either one to five million, I think it's um, possible that it reached all the way up to five million according to some resources. So very, perhaps the most populous ancient civilization as well. In terms of other images, in the top right we have a map of where the Indus Valley Civilization um, took place or existed, particularly in its zenith, so all the way up to the coast, and it's very large. You can see there there's Mohenjo-Daro about in the center, and Harappa sort of up to the uh, northeast a little bit more. To the top uh, left, but to the right of uh, Pashupati, we have Mohenjo-Daro, so you can see here how sophisticated their architecture was. To the right, we have the Great Hall in Harappa, also very sophisticated. I think there's, as we said, one of the, the causes, perhaps causes of the decline was perhaps an earthquake, and I imagine perhaps there's evidence of earthquake damage on some of these sites. Below that we have some votive images or toys, so either some sacred images to perhaps some deity or toys for children. To the right we have the swastikas, which is sort of a and perhaps and this perhaps pseudoscience from Houston Chamberlain and Govino said that these Aryans came from this area and then moved up northeast, supposedly some light people, and there's this these swastikas and the swastikas we can speculate as to what they mean, but nonetheless I think at this time they were certainly the Indus Valley civilization was certainly more peaceful than the Third Reich. Um, I would I would hope. Um, and to the right we have a bull terracotta boat, so evidence that firstly that they could perhaps go on the water. Below the um, bottom left, we have boats and birds, which so the, the hypothesis here is that on using the boats, they would use birds perhaps to direct their, their 
travel, or maybe the birds were star constellations, I might hypothesize too. But nonetheless, they had some sort of navigation systems, and once again, evidence that they were seafaring. To the right, we have Harappan weights, which is something very sophisticated to have in 3,000, maybe as far back as 3,300 BCE, having a weighting system, which I think would have been very helpful to, uh, on a larger scale, to, to even manufacture or create such large architectural projects. To the right, we have some symbols in the Indus script that sit above the Dola Vira gate in Indus characters. So if anyone might be able to decipher that, that is a, a, a significant achievement in uh, waiting to be undiscovered. So uh, good luck to anyone interested. So without further ado, we'll move to rim, I believe it's rim scene. I think in, for example, in French, the circle flex, like at beam, abyss is a rim scene, perhaps the first and the Larsa empire. So I'll call it rim scene, but I might make an error and call it rim sin again. But I think it's rim scene, the first and the Larsa empire. So starting with the rise and fall of the Larsa empire. So the Larsa empire is a prominent ancient Mesopotamian civilization and emerged as a regional power in the late 3rd millennium BCE. Its history is marked by a complex interplay of political, cultural, and legal developments, ultimately shaping its rise and eventual decline. Starting with its origins in the early ascendancy, circa 2025 to 1850 BCE, so the Larsa Empire's origins can be traced to a period of transition in ancient Mesopotamia around 2025 BCE. As the Ur the Third Dynasty declined, the city of Larsa seized the opportunity to assert its influence. So the Ur Dynasty was another dynasty in Mesopotamia. We've also previously covered Lagash, which is a, another city-state that rose to prominence in the Summer region, and we've also covered Summer more generally. Under earlier rulers, Larsa gradually expanded its territorial reach through strategic alliances and military campaigns, establishing itself as a significant player in the region. So if it became sort of multi, encompassed multi-groups, I think it's safe to say it was likely an empire. Starting moving to the reign of Gunganum, Gung Gunganum, I believe, circa 1932 to 1906 BCE circa on the later date as well. So one of the pivotal figures in Larsa's early history was Gungunum, who ascended to power in 1932 BCE. His reign was marked by consolidation and expansion as he successfully campaigned against neighboring city-states and secured alliances. So twofold successful, both through war but also through alliances, but I think alliances are made easier as one achieves many military successes. Gunganum's administrative reforms and policies aimed at economic stability and laid the foundation for Larsa's future growth. Moving to legal and administrative innovations, one of the unique features of the Larsa Empire was its emphasis on legal and administrative reforms. Though not as renowned as the Code of Hammurabi, the Larsa rulers implemented their own legal codes and systems. These codes regulated various aspects of society, emphasizing fairness and justice. Meticulous record keeping contributed to the preservation of legal documents and provided valuable insights into the legal processes of the time. So something that maybe reinforced its strength in the region was that it had codified laws. So I am fascinated in civil law in, in the form of codified laws. A lot of people think that law started with Justinian, but in this ancient Mesopotamian region, there were already um, thousands of years before Justinian um, legal codes written down, and even before the Code of Hammurabi. Hammurabi. Moving to cultural flourishing and urban development. At its zenith, the Larsa Empire experienced a flourishing of culture and urban development. The city of Larsa became a hub for commerce, culture, and intellectual pursuits. Architectural marvels around the cityscape reflected economic vitality and cultural richness were erected. erected. The empire's cosmopolitan nature attracted scholars, artisans, and merchants from diverse backgrounds, fostering a rich exchange in 
good ideas and goods. So even in these earliest civilizations, it seems as though all, all of them were at least in some way strengthened through trade. Moving to the rivalry with Babylon and decline, circa 1850 to 1763 BCE. In 1850 BCE, Larsa faced a formidable challenge from the Elamites. This conflict strained Larsa's resources, leaving the empire vulnerable. In 1763 BCE, Hammurabi of Babylon conquered Larsa, making a turning point for the region's history. The integration into the Babylonian Empire signaled the end of Larsa's independent rule. We will actually cover the Babylonian um, Empire. Moving to legacy and influence, while Larsa, the Larsa Empire ceased to exist as an independent entity, its legacy endured through the subsequent centuries. The legal reforms, cultural achievements, and architectural innovations left a lasting mark on the ancient Near East. And as I said, once again, through butterfly effect, I think it also even has effects to today, if not only in terms of law and codification. But I, I say many other ways too, perhaps that we don't even know. Uh, and surely that we don't even know. Elements of Larsa's contributions to Mesopotamian civilization endured, influencing subsequent legal systems, architectural styles, and cultural practices. Uh, directly on the Babylonian Empire, but even all the others that fall around in neighboring regions as well that were not conquered by the Babylonian Empire and the, the successors to the Babylonian Empire too. Thus, the rise and fall of the Larsa Empire represent a dynamic chapter in the annals of ancient Mesopotamian history. From its humble origins to its zenith as a regional powerhouse, Larsa's trajectory was shaped by a myriad of factors, including political maneuvering, military conquests, cultural achievements, and legal innovations. Ultimately, its integration into the Babylonian Empire signaled the end of an era, but the legacy of Lars's contributions to Mesopotamian civilization endured, leaving an indelible mark on the historical tapestry of the ancient Near East. So, that is the history of the rise and fall of the Larsa Empire. We will now move to a biography of Rim Sin I. So, it's possible that... Um, I, thought that an, a biography of Gungunam could uh, also be merited. However, we did cover a bit of Gungunam, and he was predominantly through military conquests and such, so there's, um, I think, a little bit more straightforward, and supposedly some sources that I've uh, gone through recommend that Rim Sin I is probably the most uh, um, significant leader in the Larsa Empire. So. Rim Sin I, also known as Rim Sin or Rim Sin the Great, was a towering figure in the history of the ancient Near East. For the purpose of um, um, smoothness, I will just say Rim Sin rather than the first every time, but I'm referring to the first one. Then he's also referred to Rim Sin the Great, but less commonly, I know on for the previous video, Yi, I did Yi the Great. Um, but here, it's, like for example, his formal page on Wikipedia is just Rim Sin the, the first, not Rim Sin the Great, but he's also considered the Great by many. So, and therefore, it's not Gunganam the Great, but it, Rim Sin the first gets that title of the Great. So, I think it also merits him being having us having a biography of him. So, he ascended to power in the city state of Larsa during the early 18th century BCE a time when the region was marked by political turmoil and shifting power dynamics. Rim Sin's visionary leadership and administrative acumen would propel the Larsa Empire to unprecedented heights, leaving it an unparalleled mark on the annals of Mesopotamian history. So starting with his early life and rise to power, the extent, exact details of Rim Sin's early life and lineage are shrouded in the mists of time, but it is believed that he was born into a noble family, into a noble family of Larsa, a, a prominent city-state located in the southern reaches of ancient Mesopotamia, as previously covered. As a young man, Rim Sin displayed remarkable intelligence and an innate understanding of statecraft qualities that would serve him well in the turbulent years that lay ahead. 
Grimstein's rise to power was marked by a combination of strategic alliances and shrewd political maneuvering. He ascended to the throne around 1822 BCE, a pivotal moment in the history of Larsa. The empire was at a crossroads, facing external threats and internal divisions. Grimstein's ascension heralded a new era characterized by his unwavering commitment to uniting and strengthening the empire. So unlike sort of other leaders who, like for example in Egypt, what some of the leaders we covered, or at least the former in the old kingdom of Egypt, we covered the one who was at the pinnacle, which who created the great pyramids, for example. But here he was actually one who created a turnaround, which is I would not maybe it's maybe it's more difficult to create a turnaround in a I mean turnaround in a trajectory. However, maybe it's a different skill set. So maybe someone who can make a turnaround would call, make a turnaround when things are going up. But nonetheless, um, I don't think that's necessarily true. But I think it's something to be said about someone who can change the momentum rather than just not carry on the momentum, whether or not they carry it very well. But it also doesn't mean someone who carries the momentum very well can, could not have created a change. But nonetheless, I think it, we need to note that it's impressive that he changed the momentum of the Larsa Empire, who had external threats and internal divisions. Moving to his consolidation of power, so from the moment he took the reins of power, Rimsin displayed a keen understanding of the need for centralization and efficient governance. He undertook a series of sweeping reforms aimed at consolidating power in his hands, centralizing administrative functions, and streamlining the empire's bureaucracy. One of Rimsin's most significant achievements was his success in integrating the diverse city-states and territories under the umbrella of the Larsa Empire. Through a combination of diplomacy, military conquests, and strategic marriages, he brought together a vast expanse of territory that stretched from the Persian Gulf to the heartland of Summer. So we covered Summer as well, and Summer is also a broader region of thought often considered to encompass a broader region of Mesopotamia. So it, the Lars Empire sort of was one of the city-states that expanded significantly. Another one was Lagash, the summer, and also in its own right sort of had its own dynamic and might have been have it be considered its own empire as we endeavored to do previously. Moving to infrastructure and urban development. So Rimsin's reign witnessed a remarkable surge in architectural and infrastructural projects. Recognizing the importance of agriculture to the empire's prosperity, he oversaw the construction of an extensive network of canals, which facilitated irrigation and boosted agricultural output. These projects not only ensured food security, but also served as a testament to Rimsin's far-sighted approach to governance. So a comparison we could draw to perhaps Yi the Great is that he was he knew how to um, that uh, Rimsin knew how to make canals, so not only was he perhaps good in conquest, and perhaps it seems like he was good in marriage too, and diplomacy and such, but he was also perhaps quite technologically sophisticated for the time, or perhaps he, maybe he had a, a perhaps a sidekick who did all the work, who knows, but nonetheless it's under his umbrella, and nonetheless he has the credit for it. The city of Larsa, Rimsin's power base, Sin's power base, underwent a dramatic transformation under his leadership. Majestic temples, palaces, and administrative buildings rose to dominate the cityscape, showcasing the empire's cultural and economic vitality. As I always note previously, is that not only creating big structures creates pride within the people, but also perhaps fear from uh, opposing forces. These architectural marvels stand as a, an enduring testament to Rimsin's vin, vision for a flourishing Larsa. Moving to military campaigns and territorial expansion, so Rimsin's prowess as a military strategist was instrumental in the expansion and consolidation of Larsa, of the Larsa Empire. He led his armies to numerous victories, securing the empire's borders and subduing rival city-states. His military campaigns extended the empire's influence over vast territories, from the alluvial plains of southern Mesopotamia to the foothills of the Zargos Mountains. To diplomatic engagements, while Rimsin was form a formidable military leader, he also recognized the importance of diplomacy in maintaining regional stability. He forged strategic alliances with neighboring empires such as Babylon and Elam, 
creating a web of relationships that contributed to the empire's security and economic prosperity. So while he was making alliances with Babylon, he would eventually come to uh, take over. Moving to his role and title. Uh, moving to cultural flourishing, pardon me, Ramesses' reign was marked by a cultural renaissance that left an unparalleled mark on the empire's identity. Literature, mathematics, and astronomy flourished under his patronage. So something given notes is that not only were the empires good at creating great structures and aqueducts themselves, but they also had patronage, and they also sort of had other people creating great structures as well. So patronage is an important part of leadership, as we're starting to see. The empire's scholars and scribes made significant advancements in various fields, contributing to the intellectual legacy of the ancient Near East. Moving to legal and administrative systems, Rimsin was a pioneer in the codification of legal and administrative systems, perhaps one of the first in the world. The world had never seen. Maybe there were many four, maybe a Graham Hancock is correct, and there were many civilizations before the, um, before the last ice age. Who knows? But as far as we know, this is one of the earliest legal systems, and Rimsin was one of the leaders in causing this. He recognized the need for clear and standardized laws to ensure justice and maintain social order. His legal code, known as the Code of Rimsin, provided a framework for governance that influenced subsequent legal systems in the region. Moving to challenges and legacy, in the latter years of Rimsin's reign, the empire faced a series of challenges, including external threats and internal dissent. These pressures, coupled with the complexities of governing a vast and diverse empire, tested Rimsin's leadership. Nevertheless, his enduring legacy as a visionary ruler and empire builder remains a testament to his remarkable achievements. Rimsin's death, or circa around 1763, marked the end of an era. His successors would face the daunting task of preserving and expanding the empire he had built. While the Larsa Empire would eventually succumb to the shifting tides of history, Rimsin's legacy endured, influencing subsequent generations and leaving an unparalleled mark on the rich tapestry of Mesopotamian history. So, thus, Rimsin, the visionary, the first, the visionary, or the great, the visionary ruler of Larsa stands as a towering figure in the annals of ancient Mesopotamian history. His reign was marked by a rare combination of military prowess, administrative acumen, and cultural patronage. Through his strategic vision and unwavering commitment to the prosperity of the Larsa Empire, Rim Sin, Sin left an enduring legacy that continues to resonate through the corridors of time. His contributions to the fields of governance, infrastructure, and culture serve as a testament to the enduring impact of great leaders on the course of human history. This is kind of the argument of Carlyle that uh, on heroes, hero worshipping, and the heroic in history that a few great leaders do really shape the world. Um, then there's the Tolstoyan argument and the, at the end of War and Peace and it says there are more cogs in the wheel, but I think the fact that some leaders can change momentum might be evidence that Carl, Carlisle might be right, but maybe you could go back to Tolstoy and say the people caused that shift. But Rim Seen the First, or Rim Seen the Great, will forever be remembered as a beacon of inspiration for generations to come. I might add, and I was thought about mentioning this earlier, but in the Old Testament, which I actually have here, there's a in the story of uh, Solomon, this is the King, King James Version, in the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, there's a biblical king named Arioch of Elasser, and Elasser is potentially Rimsin, um, or perhaps one of his descendants and one of the other Rimsin, and nonetheless, he was one of the four kings that defeated Sodom and Gomorrah. Um, that is not necessarily true, or perhaps Elazar is, the, uh, the word is similar to Larsa, so perhaps he's king of Larsa, Ariok, so perhaps it's, um, Ariok might mean Rimsin, but uh, I think very likely perhaps true, um, or perhaps not true. I like to think that, um, I like to believe things that are more likely true than not, but because I, I, li I don't like to, I don't like to think that there's false information going around all over the place, but Nonetheless, there's an attested connection to the biblical king of Arioch. So I guess now we can proceed to talking about the slide as I've already started to do. So on the top left, that is an image of Rimsin the first, which is interesting that he's got something on his head because it's often seen as sort of something laborious, but I guess no labor was below him. Um, 
yeah, I guess maybe it's an honorable thing. To the right, we have uh, the Worshipper of Larsa, which is a famous structure actually from the, uh, Babel, uh, uh, from the, from the late, later times, but nonetheless, it's a, somebody, a worshiper of Larsa, uh, worshiping for, I believe, a Babylonian king, and it's in the Louvre, so something that I believe of when I had been to the Louvre a few times, I, I probably walked past and didn't notice it, but now, next time I go, I'll really take note of the worshiper of Larsa. It's one of the oldest statues we have, uh, at least in the Louvre. Uh, in terms of facts here, we have significant leader, Ramesin the first empire, Larsa, period circa 2025 to circa 1763 BCE, million square kilometers, 0 0.10 million square miles, 0.04 percent of the world, 0.07 percent, so a little bit on the smaller side, but maybe it's even larger, maybe they did encompass more city-states and to what extent its influence expanded beyond its regions, hard to say, but nonetheless it influenced, for example, Babylon, which eventually, the Babylonian Empire, which eventually uh, conquered it. Um, capital, Larsa, which is a you know, city-state um, in the summer region, or Mesopotamian region. Government, monarchy, common language was Akkadian, so we did cover the Akkadian Empire as well. Religion, unknown, potentially animistic or polytheistic, um, uh, both of them perhaps equally likely, but perhaps, or maybe they had no religion, but I think they did, Must it was very likely they had some religion, because um, I think that helps consolidate the state and keep people together and keep order, fundamentally, at least at these times. In terms of population, tens of that tens to hundreds of thousands, so a little bit smaller, at least smaller compared to the Indus Valley civilization, but there's evidence that it was more consolidated. So maybe there were fewer people, but they were much more uh, under the grips of, for example, leaders such as Rimsin the first. Other images to the right of the worship of Larsa, there's a full list of the kings of Larsa, so it's very fascinating that that has been documented. To the right, we have a letter uh, to Sin. Edenam, who was one of the kings of Larsa, to, from Hammurabi. So it's interesting that they were communicating through some common language, which I believe would be Akkadian. Below that, we have a dedication tablet of the same king, Sin Edenam. To the right, we have uh, Rim Sin, king of Larsa, written in Akkadian script. So the Akkadian script has, unlike Indus script, been translated. To the right of that, we have a dedication tablet of Rim Sin. Above that, we have some plain geometry, so I think based on some all the structures they had to create, they must have had some sort of very sophisticated knowledge of plain geometry, and here is it drawn out. To the left, we have a dog dedicated for the goddess of Ninissa, Sina, I believe it was actually from some doctor, so even at this time, perhaps doctors were wealthy. And in the, or at least important. And in the top right, we have a map of where the Larsa Empire, or the Larsa city of Larsa, was in the region of Mesopotamia. So the, that is Rim Sin the first and the Larsa Empire. And now we will now go to a, a little bit of a less conventional than we normally have comparison between Pashupati and then Rim Sin the first. So uh, obviously one is a god and one was a mortal, but we shall see. Um, but we can, what takeaways we can still have because we, there were no, uh, there are no known leaders of the Indus Valley civilization documented. But maybe if someone would be so great as to translate the Indus Valley script, we might find many. So Pashupati of the Indus Valley civilization and Rimsin the first of Larsa were both influential figures in ancient history, although they emerged from different time periods and cultural contexts. Here's a comparison. Comparison follows, starting with historical context. So starting with Pashupati, Pashupati was a deity associated with the ancient Indus Valley civilization, which thrived around 3,300 BCE to 1,300 BCE along the banks of the Indus River. Pashupati is primarily known through archeological artifacts, particularly a seal depicting a central figure surrounded by animals found in the ancient city of Mohenjo-Daro. Rim Sin, on the, the first, on the other hand, was a historical figure who ruled over the city-state of Larsa, a prominent urban center in ancient Mesopotamia. His reign dated around 18, 1822 BCE to 1763 BCE. So his his reign was um, during the time during the latter periods of the Indus Valley civilization. So 
Uh, so they did coexist for a time, the two empires at least. And if one believes the god uh, existed throughout the whole time of the Indus Valley civilization, I would say that they did coexist nonetheless. Uh, during the early, and this is called the Early Bronze Era, is the time that Rimsim the first uh, reigned. Moving to their role and title, Pashupati is commonly referred to as the Lord of Beasts. He is associated with the natural world and often depicted in a yogic posture with a headdress resembling bull's horns. Pashupati is seen as a spiritual guide and a symbol of interconnectedness in all life forms. Rimsim I was a mortal ruler who governed the city-state of Larsa. He held the title of Ensi, which denoted a political and religious leader of the Sumerian city-states. Also, he's been given the title the Great. Rimsim no I was known for his administrative acumen and military prowess, and perhaps even found a place in the Old Testament or the King James Bible or the Holy Bible, so perhaps not quite a god, but at least in the biblical canon. Moving to cultural influence, Pashupati's influence primarily pertains to the religious and spiritual beliefs of the Indus Valley civilization. His symbolism highlights the reverence for the natural world and the interconnectedness of all living beings. His legacy also extended into the latter, into the later regional religious traditions, including the development of Hinduism, and there's even still a temple to him in Nepal. Rimsin I's influence was primarily political and administrative. He played a key role in the growth and expansion of the Larsa Empire. His reign contributed to the cultural and economic vitality of the region. But perhaps Pashupati also contributed to the cultural and economic vitality of the region, perhaps in different ways. In terms of their legacy, Pashupati's seen legacy endures in the continued reverence for his symbolism, particularly in Hinduism. He is often associated with Lord Shiva, one of the principal deities in Hinduism who embodies various aspects of divinity, including creation, destruction, and meditation. As for Rimsim I, his legacy is primarily historical. His reign is remembered for its administrative accomplishments and territorial expansions during the Larsa Empire, as well legal reforms and legal codification. His achievements contributed to the broader historical narrative of ancient Mesopotamia. Thus, Pashupati and Rimsim I represent different aspects of ancient history. Pashupati Patty is a deity associated with spiritual and religious beliefs, while Rimsim I was a mortal ruler for his political and administrative prowess. Their influence and legacy have resonated through time, leaving their marks on the cultural and historical narratives of their respective civilizations. So that is sort of a best sort of Plutarch's lives type comparison we could have between a mortal and a immortal, but um, I hope maybe we learned a little bit more about both of them and a bit more about both of the respective empires. So thank you very much for the support, and I hope you continue to support as well. So thank you very much.